we do whatever we want to do. Good afternoon. I want to be here less than you, so I'll try to get. Good afternoon. Yeah, that's good. That's awesome. Uh, listen, you came to a, well, what I will call an Employment Law 101 session, a session on hiring and, and, and interviewing and the like. Um, with a quaint group of, and I'll do the math very, very quickly, seven, you can delete that from the, from the, from the um, recording, seven people. I want you to get what, you, what you've come here to expect, whatever that might be. So I have a PowerPoint presentation. I use it as a general guideline, no more, no less, okay? General guideline. It'll get us to places. If you're concerned about the types of things you can ask during hiring, during the recruitment process, um, we can certainly address those. We can address those in the context of, unfortunately, mostly the laws of the United States. They're just as unique um, as opposed to those great things that may happen in other places. But nonetheless, I think there are great similarities, great similarities I'm familiar with them. I've done work in Canada, have clients in Canada, so it's not foreign territory to me in that, percent, in that respect. I'll ask this very quickly since we have such a small group. Tell me very quickly, if you will, your name. Tell me what state or what jurisdiction you might be located in. Tell me how many employees you have and if you are responsible for hiring, for the interview processes, okay? And only because she was so less than nice. Go ahead. Between both yards? Uh, we have seven locations. So seven locations, right. 73 seven. employees. I believe it's 73 now. Um, I, mean, I am, but I'm not in charge of hiring sometimes. Um, since it's a small company, multiple people. Other people might them. interview and hire. Yep. Do you have an HR function? Are you the HR function? Yeah, kind of, and along with another woman. So okay. it depends. Okay. So you share some HR responsibility, sir. Uh, my name is Daryl Kendall. I am. I work for ISRI. Very good. I uh, occasionally do hiring, okay. and interviewing, and uh, offices in D.C., which means Maryland, Virginia, D.C. We got it. We got the great District of Columbia. Hi, my name is Kim. I am from here in Vancouver. We have a small yard, um, much smaller than your small yard. Uh, we have sixteen. People. Sixteen employees. Uh, Very good. Welcome. Thanks. Sir. Barry Stone. I'm actually from Maryland. Mm -hmm. And I'm not in, in human resources. I don't normally hire people, but I'm being requested to start hiring so that I can create a team of people. So the interviewing process, which I think is probably very important. Is I need to very good. Very good. What part of Maryland? Baltimore. Baltimore. Good deal, man. Uh, Very good. Last but not least. I'm Bob Foreman. I'm from Kansas City. We have uh, seven locations, 130 employees, and uh, I'm directly involved in the hiring process. Very good. Now let me ask this. I asked you guys about your roles in hiring. So when I hear you say directly involved, are there other people, you're running to me about your brother, do you have other manager, manager level people, supervisors who interview? Yes. Okay. Do any of you conduct what I would call 360 degree interviews where the subordinate sometimes might interview a potential um, candidate, i.e. supervisor or something else? Sometimes. Okay. And those are interesting things. The bottom line with regard to all of this, and it doesn't matter again, this part, this statement doesn't matter whether it's Canada or any of the, our 50 United States um, and territories, there are laws, there are federal laws that affect the employment relationship, whether they are applicants, people who may have applied, okay, people who actually came and interviewed, unsuccessful candidates, and then ultimately, as you can imagine, employees. 
There are laws that affect that entire relationship. And so what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to do here is at least address some of the initial, initial things that you might consider or not consider. Uh, you know, the, 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 the session was captioned, you know, what can you ask and what you can't ask. At the end of the day, as long as you don't screw up and ask the questions you can ask, you can almost ask anything. A good example for some of us, some of us, Maryland, D.C., Virginia, is it was not, it was not per se illegal to ask a person their Facebook or Instagram account password in Virginia until just about a month ago, okay? Maryland, I think a little bit sooner, maybe six months ago, maybe last year. Um, I would never recommend it, and that's something to keep in mind. Just because it's not illegal doesn't mean you should do it, right? It's fine to me. Great power comes great responsibility. Just because you can don't mean you should, even in Indiana and Illinois, all right? So, when you talk about this concept, understand, the law doesn't set a great level or, 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 or great standard. The law, I like to tell people all the time, is responsive and reactive to conduct. It is. I'm very proud of being a lawyer. Been one for 20 some odd years, lots of years. But I will tell you, be the first to tell you, the law is not smart. The law sees what people are doing, and then someone says, ooh, that should be illegal and or that's okay. Right? So it reacts to events. It would never cross my mind six years ago to ask somebody for a password to an account of theirs, right? Now, when I guess I'll ask this question. When you have candidates, how many of you actually look at their public persona, their social media persona, right? Some of you do, right? And there's nothing illegal about that per se. Frankly, some people recommend it. I'm sort of caught in the middle, why? Because it's good information and you should always get as much information as you can. At the hiring stage, the more you know, the better decision you can make. Sometimes, though, obviously, if you go to a Facebook page or an Instagram account or whatever the case may be and you discover this person's associated with a condition, a disability, or something else, you might learn something you don't want to know and could influence the hiring situation, okay? So let's go before we go further. And I'll, and I'll use, again, U.S. laws here for my friends in Canada, but I know you have similar laws and you have a lot, in some ways, you have much more protection, so more limitations even than we do in the U.S., i.e., the employees are more protected, okay? Um, there's some basic laws I want to mention before we even go further, just so you have heard them, whether you're new to this process or not. And listen, I have a paper, and I don't, I seem like it didn't make it into this batch, okay? <laughs> so send me an email, and I'll make sure you get whatever you need from this process. There are laws. In the U.S., for example, there's a law called Title VII, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. This is real basic stuff. In 1964, this law was established to bar, bar discrimination, right? based on, among other things, race, sex, color, religion, you have a very similar law in Canada, very similar, right? Or in the Canadian provinces. Um, that law was enacted in 1964 really to stop one thing. At the end of the day, it was race discrimination. That's what it was all about, right? That was Dr. Martin Luther King's civil rights movement in the whole nine yards. But it protected other categories. It protected gender, right? Religion, national origin. It protected things that mattered about a person, okay? So when I'm talking about issues of hiring and recruitment, what I'm trying to do is make sure we don't run afoul of some other laws like Title VII, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and I got plenty of papers on that, so I may very well just share those with you just so these trees won't have died in vain, even though I know you will recycle them. I know you will. I didn't mean to talk it, but it was fun, okay? Um, so what you're doing when, we're doing when we're doing this kind of session is we're sort of going through a whole host of how laws apply to a particular part of the employment relationship, to a particular part, and that being this hiring process. Now, I don't want to confuse people. Unless you are, in the United States, operating under an affirmative action obligation, an affirm take off three, an affirmative action obligation, there are not many things that you actually have to do. There are not many things that you actually are required and compelled to do, okay? If you have an affirmative action obligation, you will know it. And I'm assuming no one in this room actually has an affirmative action obligation. Do you do work for federal governments? For the federal government? You don't have contract with the federal government, correct? Okay. That's an executive order that will come into play. If you don't have that, you don't have affirmative action obligations. Okay? Now, affirmative action gets a bad rep, and I want to address that real quickly here. Because in the interview process, I'm going to tell you that you do not have, and you should never voluntarily assume an affirmative action mindset. That requires certain things, not percentages. It doesn't say you have to have this many women or this many minorities. Affirmative action obligations mean cast a broad net, okay? Why do I mention that? 
I don't need you to have those type of obligations as an employer to cast a broad net anyway. Because in your hiring and your recruiting processes, if you cast broad nets, one, you get better candidates. And two, you'll be more inoculated from claims of some type of improper questioning or discrimination, right? So it's a good step to take anyway. Not hard, not hard. I will ask this question and then we'll, we'll go forward. But for each of you, when you have job openings, where do you advertise? Not a trick question? The internet, okay, so like on a job search site of some sort, okay? Is that a federal government, is that a government run site or do you just? So your own local sites. How many of you guys use and in Virginia to so the employment commission or your state employment commission? If you don't do so, you've got value right now. What you don't know about me is this. I'm a lawyer, management side attorney. That means all of my work is done for businesses like yours, okay? I don't take individual cases. They call me, I say, no, I can't help you, go away. Sometimes I hear their facts, I'm like, man, I should take those kind of cases, but I just don't. My firm has made a decision a very long time ago that we don't sue our clients or our potential clients, okay? I will tell you about any equivocation. You in Illinois and Indiana, if you have job openings at any of those seven locations, advertise for free at the local state-run agency employment commission. Do it. Why? It doesn't cost you a penny. Two, you get to determine what the requirements are before they actually send you a candidate and three, if you're ever challenged because you screwed up the hiring process, the recruiting process, you get to say, oh no, we don't discriminate based on race, sex, religion, color, national origin, whatever it is that this person may claim. You say, we cast very broad nets, okay? Depending on where you are, you may also want to advertise in other places, and I'll talk to you about those momentarily. But look at your sources. Look at your sources for the applicant pool, okay? Use an expansive view. Don't limit yourself. Don't ever limit yourself. And I'm sorry, I should say this very quickly. Save Jonathan, who has seen me before, and my friend from Kansas City who has seen me. You guys should know something. I don't stand on any formality whatsoever. If you have questions, you ask them. If you have thoughts or you disagree, you'll be wrong for disagreeing with me. But feel free to disagree anyway, okay? Feel free to disagree. I mean, literally, they make this work for you. We got an hour and 15 minutes, and this time is yours. If you need to sneak out, sneak out. But otherwise, make this work for you. So I mean, I've got, a, again, a presentation, but this, this is not the, the way we operate. So anytime you, you think of something else, ask it. Again, as I said earlier, there are no requirements to your sources, no requirement under federal law. Frankly, when I go to states, so I'm careful about saying this about state laws, particularly recorded, I always find out what the state and locality may require. Um, the laws I deal with as a general matter are federal. They apply to everybody all across the country, okay? You know, it's sort of interesting when I'm in Vancouver and I say that I'm really going about 70 or 80 or whatever number of miles south before I really mean that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, those laws apply to everybody equally. And there are always state laws, right, and even local municipality laws that may have additional requirements. I have never seen one that required you to advertise in any particular place. But just because it didn't require it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And again, your local employment commission is a great place to advertise even if you have a website, I would always, always advertise locally. It's free, and it's a, it's, it's a good point to inoculate. You want diversity of searches, and I mean it quite sincerely. You want to have more choices. The more choices you have, the better opportunity you have to get good people. I think one of you was in with the prior speaker, the one before my prior session, and he actually had some good tips. He's an um, HR professional, SPHR by training. And he talked about some of the interview questions. Let me tell you about some of his questions, which I thought were good, trying to get to certain characteristics. This is different than characteristics. As I told you before, proud of being a lawyer. You've been one for a very long time. But if you think about the law and the things I'm telling you about, think about the law as creating a tabletop, an expectation of a minimum level of conduct, OK? The law is real simple. It says don't discriminate because of my race, my sex, my gender, my national origin right, or my abilities or disabilities. That's all it says. It doesn't say a thing about you gotta like me, does it? Right? It doesn't say a thing about you gotta treat me properly or nicely, does it? It doesn't say a thing about you should apologize for me because I woke up late this morning, doesn't it? The law says don't discriminate, it's all it says. No more, no less. So what I'm trying to get you to think about in your hiring process is though is don't, you would never strive to be the lowest level of conduct, right? You just wouldn't. So you can't use the law as your barometer, you have to think bigger than the law. 
That's what the next point is up there. A diverse search area will give you more choices. Look at the first bullet point. You would have thought I wrote this. Local employment offices. Local colleges, universities, and trade schools. Find people. Find choices. Advertise those places. I'm going to take you one step further, and I may mention it down the road. Depending on the locality you're in, always look at your workforce, not with an eye, not with an eye towards who is here, but how we got here. Okay? I'll give you an anecdotal story that's very real and how I got a very large client. When I say look at your workforce, look at your workforce and see if their makeup, if the demographic makeup of your workforce reflects the area in which you are hired. You're in Baltimore, so I know what type of area you are recruiting in. And if you look at your workforce and your workforce looks more homogeneic, okay, not sort of matching the workforce as a whole, it's not that you've done anything wrong. There's nothing legal about that. But ask yourself, how do we get here? Okay? If I'm in Israel, I'm in the District of Columbia, our nation's capital. You're too young to remember when it was called Chocolate City. But that's what it used to be called back in the day. Okay? The day would be a time long before he was born. Certainly long before most of you were born, that's okay. If you have a place of employment in a place like the District of Columbia, and your workforce does not reflect the environment, it's not that you did anything wrong to get there, but ultimately, if you're ever challenged, someone's going to ask, why does it look like this? You're a good employer. Okay? Had a client. Have a client. Very good client, actually. Very, very good client. And they grew. They grew not a lot unlike most of the people I do in the scrap industry. A family-owned business. Dad, brother, dad and uncle, dad, whatever, grandparents. They started the business, and it grew from 2 to 5 to 15 to 25 to 30. Hundreds of employees, whatever the number might be. Right? And oftentimes when businesses grow that way, those businesses grow that way, one, because they're in a hot market at the right time, but not because they're necessarily thinking about all the other things that follow growth, right? The moment you get more than 15 employees in America, you're covered by 99.9% .9 of the laws that matter, okay? Once you get more than 15. And if you're at 13, you're basically covered, because that means you probably fired two people last week, okay? So don't think you can get away from it. And if you're covered that way, you need to conduct yourself that way. Had a, have a client who, are, who works in fiber optics, really high level stuff, fiber optic stuff. Stuff was started at a, at a really good university. I won't mention their name, I'll simply tell you, a really good university. And um, they both came out and this fiber optic thing was blowing up. Started this business in his garage, in his garage with a partner. The business grew, business grew to 50 employees, business grew to 200 employees. The business was in the metropolitan area that had a minority population of about 20%. About, so one out of five, minority population. African American, Indian, whatever it might be, about 20%, right? So the one out of five employees, you would think you might get one of those. 200 employees, they had two minorities. One of the guys got fired, let me be very clear. In my humble opinion, this employee deserved a very good dose of firing, right? He was not meeting the expectations of the employer, it had nothing to do with his race, right? But he got fired. I was not representing him at this time. I got them later. I'll tell you how. Bad counsel will get you new lawyers. I'm not the lawyer. Okay? So this guy gets fired, properly so. This guy goes off to the EEOC. In America, you go to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission if you follow race claim. He goes to the EEOC, and the EEOC says, we want to talk to you. The employer says, we've done nothing wrong on the advice of their counsel, then counsel. We're not going to really bother talking to you guys. Big mistake. Massive mistake. Anytime someone from the federal government, whichever government wants to talk to you, your job is to open the door, smile pleasantly, and then get them out as fast as you can, never being disrespectful. Because they're just people doing their jobs. Okay? I'm telling you this as a guy who won work at DOL, but now I'm opposing them in every situation. And I'm going to tell you, the worst thing you can do is make them your enemy. Don't do that. It's bad counsel. Keep it in mind. Okay? So they didn't do that, though. They shut the door. EEOC says, hmm, this doesn't look right. We're going to come visit you, because they have the right. They carry badges, right? We're going to come visit you. They come visit, and they see a workforce of 200 employees in a really high-level market, high-earning jobs, and they see two, no, one now, African-American employee. And they walk around looking. And they come from a different metropolitan area, so they're just looking, and they go, statistically speaking, one out of five of these people should be minority. And out of 200... What would they give us? All right? They give us some number, 40, whatever it is, right? Give or take, right? 160, 40, that's about right. 
I don't even do numbers, but I know that to be right, Donald. Right? About 40, but they saw two. One just got fired. They turned what was an individual termination case into a class action race and gender case because anything happened to notice that the women seemed not to be promoted up. So this thing that should have been literally just a, 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 a small blip on the scale of life turned into a major, and I will tell you that I negotiated very well for them, an over a million dollar settlement, over a million dollar settlement because they got bad advice in the front end. How did this happen? Let's go back to recruitment and hiring, okay? I told you, there are not many requirements that you can have. These two guys started this business out of their garage, fiber optic business. Think about fiber optics today and where we are today, right? It's sort of the other end of the recycling scale, but that's what it is. It's the high tech, it's there. They started this in their garage and they said, you know, we need somebody. So the first guy said, I got a cousin, he's great, we need a job. They brought the cousin in. The next guy said, I got a brother, brought him in. They went to a church. Now, what you may not know, and I'll say this for you two in particular, in America, in America, 11 o'clock on Sunday is known as something in worlds that, that you know, live that part. And that is, and we are a very diverse community, be very clear about this, right? But 11 o'clock on Sunday, when people go to church, it's known as the most segregated hour in America. That's what it is, because oftentimes, while we work together, while we play and, and support teams together, do all these kind of things, ultimately when sometimes we go to church, we go separate ways. And they had the idea they would advertise at their church because they knew those people. So this business that grew from two to five to 25 to 200 grew basically by word of mouth hiring. And the problem is once they got challenged, those hiring practices appeared to be discriminatory. I'll give you a footnote. The primary owner, the primary owner, white male, he was married to a black woman. But that didn't matter because the hiring processes didn't work. So before you start talking about what kind of questions to ask, look at your pool. Look at where you're recruiting from. You don't have to hire anybody. Let me be very, very clear about this. But what you have to do is cast that broad net to give yourself the opportunity. So when people come in and say, well, I never even heard of an opening there, you're, you're smart and careful. All right? These are the same issues that affect employees who promote from within. It's not an issue that you can't promote from within. I recommend it. I think you should. But you always ask yourself, is this an opening where a third party, someone on the outside, could fill? Right? Or once I promote from within, is there another opening that we may want to advertise? Don't lose those opportunities to advertise. That's the, that's the more of that story. Local schools, trade organizations, ask me questions anytime. Ooh. You cannot get to questions without the application. By show of hands, all of your hands, please be active and respond to me. How many of you actually use job applications for openings? Okay. If you didn't raise your hands, and I don't care where you're located, use job applications. Use an application for your job. But why, Victor? I had this conversation last night with one of your other attendees. Large company, about 200, 225 employees. And I told him, I said, listen, without any equivocation, you cannot take people's resume as the only introduction to your agency. But why not? Resumes tell us everything you need to know. Where they went to school, what kind of job they had. Well, no, they don't. The resume is the best face I can paint for myself, right? Think about it. If I spent 25 years in prison, you're not going to see that. You're going to see that I went to Heritage High School. You can see I went to the University of Virginia. You can see I went to Washington Law School. I'm not going to say a thing about this right here. You can see I started work right here. And that's what's going to happen. Your application is going to ask me to fill in my openings. And if there are significant gaps, you get to ask. Ask about the gaps. So if you don't use applications, get an application. Trust me on that. It's worth your time. So at, at, Go what, ahead. Point, at what point in the process do you get that? When you bring them in for an interview or before that? The application? Sure. Some folks actually have applications available online. I'm not really a big fan of applications being available all the time because it might imply openings all the time, another issue. Advertise when you have an opening, don't just take people in all the time. But when you have an opening, you can either say, here, click this PDF and download, bring it in, and or here, take this and fill it out. I don't care which one, but the important thing is when that person starts your process, you give them your form. Now you can take that resume and staple it on the back, that's absolutely fine. We well, see, not everybody has a resume either. And in this crap industry, I can't imagine all of them do. So, but everybody can have an application. Everybody. 
I use the example Bill Gates. Bill Gates come to my place of employment, fill out the application, Bill. You can buy me 25 times over, but fill out my application. All right? So, yes, absolutely. The resume tells you their story. You want to hear the complete story. And your application will elicit the complete story. Part two of the application, maybe up here somewhere, and I'll get to it in a minute, is when you get it, look at it. When you get it, read it. When you get it, follow it. Try to see it before the interview process. Whoever's interviewing, make sure you do. Make sure you see it beforehand. I'll tell you stories about that too. Huh. Let me say this. You could probably, not probably, you certainly can. You can Google right now job application and go find one. I love Google. I Google all kinds of crap. Matter of fact, when my, thing, when my server tripped over the Bing one of them, I was like, get mad and go back to Google. But I'm going to tell you without any equivocation. You know how much I pay for Google? Nothing. Right? Oh, I take that back. Really? Well, I got Wi-Fi here. Thank you, Israel. I needed it because I'm, 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 I'm Roman. Rogers. I know you do. The bottom line is it's free. And all I will tell you is you get what you pay for. Be very, very careful. I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer, and I don't mind telling you, it was sometime before, this thing is huge, massive. If you don't have one yet, I'm not sure I can tell you to get a 6 Plus. It's the iPhone 6 Plus. It's just a little bit big. I'm not giving you a hard time, Apple. Don't sue me. But I own it. It's a little big. That's okay. Before I had this thing, and it was always in my presence, always in my existence, every so often, I'd go eat fast food. It's true. It's like a confessional. Now, I will say, I had told anyone who would listen, this is my public service announcement for 10 seconds, McDonald's french fries, once they're fresh, right? They are like the best thing ever made, <laughs> period. No, just bar none, right? I mean, seriously, you just go to Wendy's, get your burger, go back to McDonald's, get the fries, and if you're fresh, you're good. I will say I've had some really good fries here. I've said I've eaten once, alone, you know, once or twice alone by myself here. One time I didn't have my phone, and I mentioned this for a reason. I'm a lawyer. So I'm sitting in a place and I got my food. And you know, when you get your food on a tray, oftentimes they have something like, thank you for eating at X, right? And then if you really like X, flip over in the back. And it's an application. It's an application. Why? Because they think if you like eating there, you might be a good employee. True. I'm not making this up. I was eating at a major, major national, I ah, forget that, worldwide chain. Worldwide chain. And this was about two years ago. Two years ago. So I'm not going to say it was yesterday, but it was like two years ago, maybe even three. And I didn't have any one of those electronic devices to distract me. So what do I do? I'm a lawyer. I flip over the application. Because I've got, got to look at something. Otherwise, I'm going to sit there looking like a dork even by myself. Right? And I'm eating french fries, which I'm really enjoying, but they were not McDonald's. Okay? And I'm sitting there, and I look at the application. And among the things on the application, again, not applicable to you, but it may very well be, among the things on the application were, tell us your name, um, last you know, date of education completed, and then one of the questions was, We'll get to it in a minute, but I'm going to do it anyway. Are you a U.S. citizen? Is that a legal question or a legal question? Y'all can play. Illegal? Illegal? Legal? Illegal. That's good. Man, what do you think? Oh, come on, okay. I won't give you a hard time, but I'm not going to give you guys a hard time either. Go ahead. I think it's illegal. I think it's the way it's worded. Are you a citizen of the United States of America? Yes. That's the question. You know, it is surprising to some people that that question is absolutely illegal as a matter of course. There are certain law enforcement, military defense contractor positions where you can ask and you care whether a person is a citizen of the United States of America. But the true, accurate question is, are you legally eligible to work in the United States of America? I.e., do you have a visa, a green card, do you have some permission to work? That's the question. And so when I flipped it over and I saw this question, let me be very, very clear, and I don't mean this in, a in, in any way that's, that's going to be taken poorly on cameras, you know, a year from now, six years from now, but you don't have to be a U.S. citizen to flip a good burger. You don't, right? Now, you may not have temporary status to work long doing that, because maybe other people who can do the job, but you don't have to have a unique skill set. So generally speaking, the question is, are you legally eligible to work in the U.S.? That's the legal question, okay? And those kind of small nuances are the things that can get people in trouble when they use a pre-printed application. Be careful of that. Google is great, but you get what you pay for, okay? All right, 
So that's the example of pre-funded forms exposing country and liability. A good application, now this would ask or assume that you take an application, a standard one, and you modify it for the job. That's aspirational on my part, okay? That's me dreaming in, in, in Victor Lawyer land. And I love dreaming in Victor Lawyer land because that makes me feel good about me. I don't get to fly 12 hours away up north and see snow, but I don't want to either. I'm thinking about 12 hours that way in, in you know, 75, 80. Yeah. No palm trees, but it's all good, baby, deep in the spring. All right, an application can uncover information about personality and character. And I will tell you, I will tell you, I talk about documents and forms. You know, good HR training can also give, give you some skill sets, some questions and things to ask. And I might quote Carl in a few moments, because he has some good ones, I thought, right? You want to balance your questions with, which elicit needed information against risk of being too broad. Let me say it another way. Ask what you need to know, either on application and an interview. Ask what you need to know. And the question you ask is this. Is it always job related? Is it work related? If it's work related, pretty much you can ask it. Okay? Now I'm an attorney. You guys know this now. I played football when I was young. I played for the University of Virginia when I was young. I had a little bit of time after that. You're right, it was all good. I used to be fast when I was young. Right? Used to be fast or faster. Now, I'm, now I don't even run. Different conversation, right? But so if I had on my application, how fast is your 40? Now I might want to know that or how much can you bench press? But I don't know many lawyers who need to run decent 40s. As a matter of fact, I dare say most don't, right? So it's not, it may be interesting to me, but it's not job related. So make sure you ask that kind of question. Ask questions that are listed to gain the information you need to address the job. This is a great time for me to say it. I'll say it now, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it again. How many of you actually have job descriptions for the positions that you might have available by show of hands? All right. Again, I always look at this as a time value for money. We're in Vancouver. The sun is out, which means this is really high value time, people. High value time. We should not be here. But you came, and so I stayed. All right. But let me say this without any equivocation. For those of you who did not raise your hands, you have to have job applications or job descriptions that describe the essential functions of the job. Every employer, United States employer in this room who has 15 or more employees is covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. <clears throat> the manner in which you avoid initial concerns under the ADA is to have accurate job descriptions. It'll be worth your time, right? Because you only need it when you need it. It's not like insurance even. This is a little bit different. Because insurance, you need it, you go ask for it, and then they tell you no. That's what happened in America, at least, right? And my friend who spoke a few sessions before, he was from an insurance company, I told him that. He made a lot of lawyer jokes. I told him about insurance jokes. But for the rest of you, Unlike a job description, it won't tell you no. The job description is something you can actually say, no, when I interviewed this person, we were following these parameters right here. We were following this document, which had been well thought out and designed to elicit the proper person for the job. Where should that be? Where, where should you be? Is, is it something you're giving to the person, or is it the job description should be in the, in the advertisement somewhere where you're looking? It's a great question. His question is, just for repeating, um, just to repeat it, is where should the job description be? Should it be in the advertisement, or should, it per should the person have it available when they're interviewing? And I'm going to suggest to you it's the latter. In the advertisement, you want to advertise, let's just say, forklift operator one. All right? So whatever. Which means I want you to have some experience, but you don't have to be the most experienced forklift operator. So generally speaking, people may send in applications, whatever. You can say job description is attached if it's easy to do. Right, but if you're, and if you're advertising, for example, at the Employment Commission, they can have a job description right there in our hands so that when they are giving you an initial assessment, they're already screening out people like me who've never driven a forklift in my life, right? So if it's at the point of position, if, if you can have it out there early, but at the worst case scenario, the job description is available upon interview. I want the person to sit there and frankly maybe even read it before we call them in. Right? Because don't forget, they're doing your application too. And if your applications, as I would like, are being given out at the time when, when the job is open, at the application, you can also have the job description. Because then when the person is applying, they're applying for a specific job, and they have already seen at least what we call the essential function of the job. So the application is a critical thing. And I will tell you, and I mean people who work in professional office environments, Isri, we're not where you have you know, people who work in scrapyards. The application and the job description are as important there as anywhere else, too. Okay? 
And these applications, some of them are going to seem almost silly to you, juvenile, right? Because a forklift operator, I'm going to say, among other things, you've got to be able to see, hear, um, uh, respond to, to, to unexpected circumstances. I'm going to say any number of things. But I'm trying to describe physical characteristics. They need to be able to bend down, lift, whatever it is they need to lift, maybe 20 pounds, 30 pounds, who knows what, to get to, you know, the forklift position. It's going to describe things in levels of nuance and detail that, frankly, sometimes seem even silly to me. But the more detail you have in the job description, the more useful it is in weeding out people who can't meet those essential functions, right? The job description is your first cut, long before we get to a place where we actually ask them questions. All right. <laughs> I have to do this because you can ask questions, but it's important. How many of you guys do background checks? Do you, have, do they, do you comply with the Fair Credit Reporting Act? That means you have a separate sheet of paper. On this. So you have an application, you don't know. That's why it's worth your time to write it down. Fair Credit Reporting Act, okay? Write it down. If you don't know, write it down. Now, there may be a similar thing in Canada. There may very well be. I don't know for certain, but I will check. Because I generally speak, and what I will tell you is this, and this is for my Canadian friends in the room. I think, um, frankly, a lot of the laws in the U.S. probably preceded some of the things that happened in Canada, but Canada has now taken those things and moved much further down the path to protect employee rights, okay? In the U.S. right now, the minimum wage in the U.S. is $7.25 an hour. That's the standard minimum wage. You may have living wages in some localities or jurisdictions, right? If you do federal government work, it's ten ten an hour for certain contractors. I know in Vancouver it's ten twenty five an hour, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that, okay? So there are lots of places where things are different, but if I say it happens in the, in the United States, I'd be at least asking the question, is it here too? Okay, I'll be asking the question. If you don't know, you've already got your time. I'm telling you. Fair Credit Reporting Act, the application should have a statement on the front of it. Literally, it's a rip away sheet of paper that basically tells the person some certain information. All of you in the applications will have disclaimers saying, you know, material omissions or information that's inaccurate or where you lie to us will result in the withdrawal of your application and or your termination after the fact. Right? That's a good thing to have. But you want to know that. You want to know that. Okay? You're going to have EEOC statements, all kinds of different things going on there. I'll talk about the interviewing process, but you've got to get to this application first. And the most important thing is it's a document that you have, and it never leaves that person's personnel file until they are gone. Okay? If they work for you for 25 years, when I see that personnel file, I should be able to get that personnel file, and the first thing you send is me the application. We don't purge personnel files. Okay? And I didn't ask this question. Do any of you have union? Okay, my Canadian friends don't surprise me at all. Unions in Canada, un unions in the EU, the concept and the ideas are 180 degrees different than the US. If you haven't heard that, you should know that, okay? You have government-sponsored situations here that are just a lot different than basically the private businesses that spring up inside of other private businesses. I know you have Teamsters. When you can say that's a good day too. If you don't know, that means they probably have me call. You will find out. It will come to your attention. Uh, you know, I mentioned that because again, that you know, that affects how you deal with records and documentation and details. Did you? Did you? You don't know his union, okay? Uh, yeah, quickly before he gets deeply involved. You know, we want to have guidelines and the application is there for a reason. We'll keep working our way through real quickly. We have the application process. Oh, you know, I said it here, and I, so I'll, you know, because I wrote it and I said it already, I want to say it again. If you have the luxury, don't accept unsolicited applications. Applications should come in for job openings and opportunities. They should not come in because somebody stops by and sees you, you know, you got a crane that's operating. They shouldn't come by because they see, you know, people leaving work and they, they getting paid. You should take job applications when, okay? All right. When you have unsolicited applications, this is what happens. You get a backlog of applications, right? And unless you have a policy, for example, where after you have an application on file for Let's just say six months, right? So I take six months of applications. I finally have a job opening here. And then I've got some applications that came with that. When I take unsolicited applications, there's the unspoken but well-informed rule that if I have an opening, that you have an opening, that all these applications from six months ago, you're going to look at and consider. Problem with that is you didn't solicit those. You didn't know who they were qualified for. So you didn't waste a lot of time going through those applications. 
So you're not going to find the one you want from those folks six months ago because they're still looking for a job. You don't want them anyway. All right? So you find the application you want. This one came just a few weeks ago, but not looking at the prior applications you, you see or what you will hear because that person is going to see a job was open in a paper, VC, wherever they're going to see it. They're going to hear about a friend. And they're going to see there was a job open, and they're going to hear, hmm, well, I didn't get a call for it. And they're going to find out the position was shut and closed, right? And then they're going to find out that the person who got the job only had two years as a forklift operator versus their 10 years as a forklift operator. And then they're going to be like, wait, wait a minute. How did you hire that guy or that woman or whatever it is? And they never look and think, well, well, six years ago, I should have called you back and asked if you still had an application on file. That's not it. Because you had it and you accepted the applications, it's part of your, your records, your, your company's records. And so they expect that you will have looked through it. And when you don't, they're going to now look in the mirror and think, you know what? He hired him not because he was the best, because he only had two years of experience. He hired him because he was a male versus a female. He hired her because she was black, not white. And so that's going to give your non-employee an opportunity. And he left a moment ago, Mr. Wagger. Um, but he asked, you know, can non-employees sue? Yeah. So that person would actually have a cause of action under whatever category they think they, they match to sue you. Now, could they win? Should they win? No, they absolutely can win. Let me be clear about that, right? Hopefully, you'll have some legitimate non-discriminatory reason for, for getting there. But it's going to be very awkward when you're sitting in front of a jury of your peers, right, or a federal judge, because these are federal laws. And you're saying, well, Your Honor, yeah, we had the application on file. And you know, you're right. We took them in. But we never got to that one. That's awkward. That's uncomfortable. Plaintiff's lawyer is going to have a ball with you. Well, how many other people have you looked over? How many other women did you not hire? How many other minorities? Or whatever the case may be, right? It's because he's Jewish. It doesn't matter what it is. They'll, the reason will surface to the top as long as they are different than the incumbent. That's all they have to be, right? Don't select unsolicited applications if you can avoid it. All right. Huh, remember my U.S. question? Now, listen, just because of an application means it's not a good question or a bad question, too. People ask all kinds of things. Post-September 11, 2001, pre-September 11, we didn't think about religious issues or anything else to a large degree. People just lived their life. They loved them. We did them. We were like, okay, that's cool. Right? That event occurred. When you have, and I mentioned 360 interviews, man, people will ask all kinds of questions. You know, why do you wear that turban on your head? Well, that's a hard question to answer, and it's an impossible question to have to answer because, damn, I don't get the job. Religion. Right? So you have to train everybody about what's appropriate and not appropriate. Okay? Questions have to. All the questions. So when you think about your questions, not just application, but interview process, ask yourself, are they work-related? Are they essential to the core of the job? Okay? If you have a position that opens and, and it's available and people have to be at work at 7 a.m. in the morning and the position goes until, let's just say, 4, 4 p.m., you're, you're telling them the position starts at 7 and we get off at 4. Can you meet those requirements? That's all you're asking. Now, this may be a woman sitting in your, in your office, and she got 15 babies running around her, right? She had to bring them to the interview. She got 15 babies, and you saw her get off the bus, and you don't even work on the bus line. Those aren't the questions you ask. You ask 7 o'clock, 4 o'clock, can you get here? That's what you ask. Now, you may find all sorts of other reasons not to hire that particular person, but you're clear about what you're asking. Yours are related to the job, right? You know, that person says, but well, I got these 15 babies, but generally speaking, I can make it because, you know, I got daycare or my car's in the shop today. That's cool. You move on, right? One of the hardest parts about interviews, one of the hardest parts about interviews is when a person volunteers information or more information than you want or need, okay? The interview process, I like to sort of say it is a, it's an opportunity to communicate, but it's not an open dialogue and open discussion, okay? You can't ask stuff just because you're curious, nor do you accept information just because they volunteer. Okay? If a person says, I got X, Y, and Z, and the X, Y, and Z are not related to your job, the effectively trained person will say, thank you for that, let's get back to the job. Okay? During an interview process, let me be very, very clear. Let me say it again. I'm going to say it twice. I'm going to say it three times. Do not write down responses or inappropriate information on your application. You may be interviewing 5, 10, 15, 20, 35 people. Don't really matter to me. Do not write down inappropriate information. Those applications are called evidence. Okay? They are called evidence. And if a person injects something inappropriate into the conversation, you make a note of it, 
if a person is a black male and you make a note of it on the application, remember them a different way. Because if I don't get the job, and then as part of my not getting the job, I sue, and then my lawyer asks you to pre present all the evidence associated with my terminate, you know, my not being selected, and one of the things on the, on the application is right up in the corner, BM, that's gonna be a signal, okay? Just keep it in mind, just keep it in mind. Simple stuff, if I bring in something that doesn't matter, um, listen, I'm, you know, I'm here, I have a knee who has cerebral palsy, and sometimes that might be a little bit late, it's not important to you. Not important, not important. And I actually do, but it's not important. What's important is that, can you be here from seven to four? Okay, can you be here from seven to four? Interviewing, interviewing, interviewing. You asked a question, it was a great question. I want the person to have the job application as early in the process as possible so that when I'm asking them questions, they've had a chance to give me some type of informed thought. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean that I have to ship applications out there, you know, or job descriptions out there. They just have to have it at a time before they sit down with me, in my opinion, if I could have my, my best case scenario. Okay? I want them to be able to say this. Um, I reviewed the application before interviewing, and I, you know, you can rank the applicants according to what you see. That's okay. That's all okay. And again, remember I mentioned no right, but you can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know, just make sure it's not all guys in the top 25, 50, or 24 women. That would sort of suck. All right, or whatever it is, all right? Don't write comments on the original. I mentioned for a reason. Gaps in employment history. All these things are things that get us to the interview process. We got to get there, but we got to get there effectively. Because to start talking about what you can and cannot ask, don't screw this part up. Because if you mess this part up, I don't care what you ask. You've already lost, okay? The thing about litigation, the thing about plaintiff's lawyers, the people on the other side of me, they don't care when they win. They just want to win. So we got to make sure we got all the steps right to get to that place where we went. I don't believe that Canada has the same level of litigation that we have in, in, in our, your, your, your brethren to the south. But we have it. We have it. It's just part and parcel of doing business. And so the smart thing about doing business is investing some time and training the people who are conducting and dealing with these applications, job descriptions, and then the interview process. Okay? That's it. You got to be able to do it. Um, I mentioned before, let me tell you this. The one thing I will tell you without any equivocation, during your interview, every question is legal. Oh, I like this. This is going to be good. I'm going to say this for the camera. Every question is legal unless it's illegal. Ponder that for a minute. Every question is legal unless it's specifically deemed to be illegal. So I can ask if you like orange. I can ask you if you like blue. Happy the colors of my beloved University of Virginia, just so you know. I can ask you those things. Ain't nothing illegal about that. It may not even be relevant. Strange, but not illegal. Remember I told you the law was not smart, right? The law doesn't want you to ask very specific questions. Questions that might elicit information about a person's ability or disability under the ADA. Questions that might elicit information about your age. But let me say that with a caveat. I've already told you I want the application to be complete. I want the application to be absolutely complete. And I should be able to, with a, mo a minimal amount of math, be able to tell that this person finished high school in 1960. This person went into the military and served for two tours, whatever it is, in that point in time, eight years, whatever, right, 1968. And why do I care? I want to know what people were doing, okay? Now, let me just be very clear. In the United States, it's illegal. It's illegal not to consider a person's application even based on convictions now. Not just arrest, but convictions, okay? So I'm telling you I want you to have this information. But you're going to find other reasons to make these very legitimate decisions. But I want you to have the entire history working all the way to 2014. So who's ever conducting the interview, they can't get bored with the nuances and the details because that's your best chance. Let me tell you why. I give you anecdotes because I think they matter. I defended, I defended a very good client of mine, big client, power company. Big power company. Right? That's big. It was one of the first ADA type lawsuits. They had this guy. This guy worked for someone else. This guy really wanted to work for the power. It was a great employer. He wanted to work there. So this guy, unlike what you all are doing now, he kept pestering the people in the office. He kept pestering them. And he kept pestering one of the supervisors he knew. Right? Finally, the guy said, look, we got an opening. Bring him in. Right? They hired him. Because on his face, he could walk, talk, stand up. He was good enough. They hired him. They never got an application from me. Never check gaps. 
All right. They ultimately got an application, and I'll tell you how I found out about the application after the fact. Right? This guy went on to become one of the biggest plaintiffs and one of the biggest pains in there took us. Derriere? Better word than took us. Took us is more fun. Right? Bum, whatever. He sued them at least seven different times. And if you know our judicial system, in federal court, it meant district court. It meant court of appeals. He actually tried to appeal things to the U.S. Supreme Court, never got that far, but seven different times. And I'm talking about hundreds, and I'm not saying tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars of litigation for a wasted, wasted event. They had not discriminated against him at all. Had they taken his complete application, which came after the fact, after he'd been hired, so therefore nobody looked at it, they would have seen a couple of things. They would have seen that when he finished high school, he went to the military. They would have seen that he went AWOL in the military, climbed over Constantine wire. You know what Constantine wire is? That's that razor wire stuff. That stuff when you look at it, you get scared. You're like, holy crap. He climbed over Constantine wire twice, broke out of the brig, okay? Had been fired numerous times, and he actually had to put on his application. But no one checked. Those would have been good questions to ask, wouldn't it? And you don't have to ask about, you know, why you could just look and say, then tell me about why you left your last job. My boss didn't like me. Well, tell me why you left the job before that. My boss didn't like me. Well, how about the one that was before that? When you get three, my boss didn't like me, let me give you a hint. Don't hire that person. Right? Fun stuff, man. Love it. Simple. It's so simple when you see it after the fact. I can Monday morning quarterback the best situations. I'm trying to get you not to Monday morning quarterback. You've got to be ready to play the game on Saturday or Sunday, as the case may be. Right? This is where we are. This is where we are. I, I got an answer. You talked about the, uh, uh, the filling in the whole uh, timeline. Gaps. And I get that because we don't, we, we've been lax on that. I, I would say because I've seen a lot of applications come through maybe in the last 15 years. And there's, a, there's nothing before that. Mm -hmm. But Yep. And they put down their job history, but they don't put dates with it. You know, and I've been instructed not to ask about those dates as long as all the history is there. Is that correct? Yeah. Right? You know what? Let me, his question, just to repeat it, you know, for the cameras, once anything else. And, and, you know, he has older applicants who, when they fill out the applications, they put down they graduated high school, right? And then they went on to then put down another job without putting dates. And he was instructed not to go back and ask. And, that, you know, whether you go back after the fact and ask or not, I'm sort of with them. I don't do that. But in the current day, let me be very clear. There are management and attorneys, lawyers like me. I hope not many, but there are some who might tell you, ooh, avoid the dates. The only reason you're avoiding dates, to be very, very clear, the one particular law that's the issue is the Age Discrimination Employment Act. That's law protects people over the age of 40, right? So the moment you get enough dates and figure out a person over the age of 40, you're like, ooh, can we not take anything? Let me be very clear, people. You don't have to hire somebody just because they're over 40. You don't have to hire somebody because they're black. You don't have to hire somebody because they're female, because they come in in a wheelchair. You don't. You just got to find a more qualified candidate. So for me, when I weigh the risk, when I weigh the risk, the risk of not asking any dates whatsoever and just taking this document, because think about it. If I don't put dates down, you don't know what the heck I've been doing, do you? Right? Now, I may put down from, you know, I worked there for 12 years or whatever, but most of us, you don't know where I've been. Right? So I'm okay. I'm okay. I like saying, when did you start? When did you finish? I'm okay with that. Right? That's my advice. Take it. You, it's what, worth what you paid for. Yeah, you ain't gave me nothing yet. Everybody better. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I'm okay with it. I think you asked the dates because on balance, we're not going to discriminate against people because, they're, because of their age. But we need to know to have a full record of what they were doing. So I understand the advice that people gave. But I think at some point in time, you have to make the law work for you as opposed to being afraid of doing anything. And that's where you are. You're in a place where you have to ask legitimate questions. Ask them. And as long as they're work-related, and I think you know, getting a person's complete history is important. Let me be very clear about something real quickly. Applications, I should say it in, at this point, and I'm glad I, I thought of it, because it's not in this PowerPoint presentation. Do any of you work in jurisdictions that have, that have quote, banned the box? You heard of the phrase? Interesting. I'm surprised. I'm particularly surprised that even in D.C. That's good. Well, yeah. And I would think Chicago. Ban the box. In the United States, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, it was always appropriate. You could not ask about arrest, arrest records, okay? Because history tells you, statistics tell you that minorities are more frequently arrested than non-minorities. 
So if you had about arrest, you might say, well, Victor's been arrested three times, right? Not realizing that I wasn't convicted or tried anything else. And convictions had always been appropriate. The box on the application I'm referring to, so check your applications when you get them or if you have them, is that question, have you been convicted of a crime? Yes or no. If you live in a ban the box city or jurisdiction, in Roanoke, Virginia, for example, the city has banned that question, right? But it's still available in the private sector. But you want to know this. You want to know this. It wouldn't surprise me at all if Kansas City has banned the box. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I think it's a silly movement, but that's me, and I can tell you why. But if you're in a jurisdiction where you cannot ask that question, please get it off of your application because by definition, you already run afoul of the EEOC. Okay? Please, just keep it in mind. Why? They want you to ban the box because they think it's not fair for a person who's been convicted to have to tell you that at the start of the interview, though you can ask it after the fact. I think that's silly. Right? I'd rather say, look, check the box, yes or no, then come in and blow me away with your explanation. You know? I had small kids, man, we were hungry. I tried to take a loaf of bread, but that just wasn't enough, so I sold drugs, right? I stopped. I did it for six months. I stopped. I got caught. I went to jail. That is over. I might still take that person. That sounds like a good applicant. Sounds like a person who otherwise got a job and might be working. I understand his answer. So ban the box. If you, if, check that because it'll be in your jurisdiction, your municipality. You'll know it. Go ahead. Two things. Uh, oh. It's a very good question. Let me say it again. His question is, when I ask for dates, aren't you inviting an age permission lawsuit? And what I'm going to tell you is this. I don't jaywalk, right? I don't. I don't. If the light says walk, I walk. But if the light says 5, 4, 3, I'm still walking because it's legal. The ADEA simply prohibits you from discriminating based on age. Now, it's absolutely true. If you have no dates whatsoever and even no time frames, then you can't discriminate based on age unless, of course, you're looking at me and I got gray hair. I cut mine for a reason. Okay? Right, so you can't. And the guy says, well, he, I didn't put it on my application, but he's specifically asking those questions. And I look like I'm 49 years old. 49 years old. I'm going to tell you as a lawyer, I'm going to tell you my advice to my clients is I want you to ask the dates because, as I told you before, so this, this is a cost-benefit analysis, people. This is a weighing of what you get versus what it's worth. Right? For me, the information to understand when they worked in places and how long they worked there tells me more about how good an employee I might get versus the small chance that a 49-year-old or a 50-year-old is going to raise a claim against me, particularly if my workforce looks like what I expect it looks like. And there's, I got people in my workforce who are 65, 67, 68. Maybe some of my best crane operators are people who are dang near 70 years old. My mom is 77. Now, she can operate a crane, but I would love to have her as an employee because she's conscientious. So we're not. And so when this person raised the claim, yes, they're going to get in court and say, he asked me about these dates right here, and that's just wrong. And then first of all, I'm going to say, well, it's not illegal to ask about dates as a matter of course, right? And then I'm going to say, but we do it for everyone. Go look at the 21-year-old's application, same dates. Look at the 30-year-old's application, same dates. Look at the 7-year-old's application. So it does not seem to me that we're asking these dates to elicit information about your age that's inappropriate. That's how facts get to come out. Okay, and that's why we're consistent, and that's why we train, train, train. It's a great question. Well, the thing is, uh oh. Okay, travel safely. What if he volunteers the information that he's convicted felon? Which we have a guy that did 20 years for murder. He's one of our best. We hired. Let, one of our best employees. let me say this without any equivocation. I'm not a psychologist or anything, and don't play one on TV. But people will tell you crimes of passion, heat of passion, sudden provocation. It's called hop on sup. Heat of passion, sudden provocation. That's what it's called. Those people are less likely to commit another crime than people who steal, right? People who steal, those are your ethics, right? That's moral turpitude. Those are the people who do it again. Damn, I got, a, I got a good point right here. I think I will take it, okay? So people who commit a murder, they could absolutely be your best employee. So that doesn't surprise me whatsoever. No, if someone volunteers information, you don't have the box there, and it explains the gap, right? Again, the form can't say it in band and box jurisdictions, but the form does not preclude conversation. Because the form, while it can ban the box, they should understand that employees are asking, tell me about it. You know, I will take that guy who says, listen, man, I got into a bar fight, and the next thing you know, the guy fell and hit his head, and holy crap, I'm in jail for manslaughter, right? I dang on sure didn't mean that to happen. It was too many beers. It was a dumb situation, a dumb moment. And, you know, I, I spent that time, and I'm out, but I can do this job. I'm going to hear that guy. 
that's part of a good interview process. That's asking questions. Let me say this about interviewing. You ask a question, you get the answer and listen. Formulate, okay? I don't want too many people going off script. I do like scripts. I like at least consistent initial questions. But the responses to those questions may guide the next question or two, and that's okay. Okay, that's okay. So when you, now, that's different though, because you asked a very good question. This question was, what happens through the interview process when someone elicits information or promotes or provides you information that you really didn't ask for and you don't want it? You know, because instead of getting that, you, the guy says, well, yeah, you know, I'm a recovering drug addict and I'm actually a recovering alcoholic. Now, under the ADA, a person who has a record of recovery, right, record of recovery, both drugs and alcohol, they can be protected. And you're like, oh, I didn't ask all that. At that point in time, and I said it earlier and I'll say it again, there is where you want to take the interview and you want to say, listen, thanks for the information, but I want to make sure we stick with the job-related information that we need. And that's all you do. Okay? It would be silly to say, ooh, I didn't hear that. La, 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 la. That wouldn't work. But it works to say, listen, you know, right now I want to make sure we focus on these things right here. Because in an interview in America under the ADA, American Disabilities Act, after you've offered a person a job, post-offer, but pre-employment, okay? So I've offered you a job, and I told you you're going to start on May 15th. I got two and a half weeks, whatever it is. There, I can elicit as much medical information about you as I want. I can send you to the doctor to get physical examinations and all kinds of different things. And then I can make decisions. Why is that dangerous? Because I've offered you a job. And if something comes back in the offer, an examination tells me to rescind the job, you need a doctor telling you that they can't perform the essential function. So they go to the doctor with the job description, right? And among other things, I assume, whew, you know what assume, you know what that means, right? You know what it does to you and it does to me? Okay, no, really her, that one back there from Indiana, Illinois, I'm going to give her a hard time. I hope that all of you are conducting drug testing post-offer pre-employment. In your industries, I don't want to overstate it. I'll simply say I think it would be ill-advised not to do that. The danger, the work, the, the, just the exposure, frankly, the risk of loss, right? All those reasons are reasons why you should be doing that. But again, that's something that happens post-offer, pre-employment. So at the interview stage, when someone tries to inject information here about, well, listen, I'm a great employee but I have insulin dependence, so every so often I have to do this. I'm a great employee, but I'm Muslim, so I have to pray you know, this many times. Whatever it might be, your job said, listen, this is, our, this is our job description. Can you perform these essential functions with or without reasonable accommodation? Sort of sounds like a rote routine, but it is a rote routine. It's a, it, there's a reason there. Religion's a different conversation, but nonetheless, it's still you know, one that we don't need to bring in. That's not important for us right now, all right? Maybe who you are, but it's not important for us right now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the judiciary is responsible. And uh, I mean, aren't you able to ask a question? Because I mean, if I have to be so bonded, if they're a felon, I can't even have to get a job. That's awesome. Because we've got to be bonded. So his question is I mean, where, where can I not ask questions? I mean, and again, go back to it. The band box initiative that I referred to talks about the application itself, it does not talk about the actual interview. Okay? So if I am looking for someone to handle money, or whatever the case may be, or go into someone's home or places to recover washing machines, whatever it is, they might go recover scrap, right? And those people have to be bonded. Then it's very, listen, it's, I mean, what, and the way you'll get to that very quickly, don't forget your job application over here. We are looking for, I don't know what the title would be, but recovery people or whatever, whatever the phrase is. And with that, that means you may have to be bonded, right? Or, and this would be federal government, so I'm not gonna say it, but or you, you know, we go and we recover certain things from the military, so you may have to pass a security clearance. Can you pass a security clearance? Or are you willing to subject yourself to a security clearance and or bonded? And that's when they should check, no, can't do it felon. Or they say yes, and then you just ship them off if they're the best candidate, and they come back and say, oh, no, no, you, this person you sent us, can't do it. You haven't made the decision. A third party has made that decision. Now, I am glad or in heart, heartened to hear, in our last session, there was a fellow from California, United States of California, love it, right? United States of New York, not that different. United States of West Virginia, right? And you're close enough that, I don't, you know, you're close enough. 
there was a fellow, and this is an interview process, and I, had, I have a client, and, this, and it's going on right now, and I don't know what the heck's going to happen because of the location we're in. They, they have an opening for an engineer, an engineer in an automotive manufacturing facility they, they service. The position says this engineer has to be to climb ladders and scaffolding and the like. Okay? He needs to be able to get to the plant. And as part of the process, because they work for an automotive manufacturer, and then you, you, know, you may or may not have the, this understanding, but let me tell you about it. When an automotive manufacturing process goes down, it's measured in seconds. I mean, if there's a, if there's a downtime, it's measured in seconds and minutes and whatever the case may be. And if you are a party, a party who is serving them and you don't match what they require, and I'm talking about all the good ones. When I was walking down the street, Burrard Street just now, this morning, they were filming a Ford commercial. I knew it was a Ford commercial. They had all these pretty shiny Fords and the streets were blocked off and the police were there. You know what was funny about it? It was a black Mercedes all covered over the head of the camera. I was like, dude, you can't do that. You can't film a Ford commercial for Mercedes, but it was cool looking, I have to tell you. Okay, fine. They measure their times in small, small increments. So this fellow who's now come in for an application, my clients called me and said, he's coming in. This is a true story. He's coming in. And they knew this about him. When they saw him, they walked in, he was an amputee. He had lost a leg. Not in the war, motorcycle accident. So I mean, I just want to make sure we're very clear, right? And if you ride motorcycles, public service announcement, stop, right? There's always one leg left in the emergency room. Be careful about it. Oh, I'm, I'm looking right at you. All right, fine. So this guy comes in and applies for the job. Well, listen, there are some amazing prosthetics out there. Amazing. People can run, you know, like Pastorius can run a pretty good 400. He can do other things, too. Who knows? We'll see. Right? It was a bad example, but it was the best one I could think of. He ran the Olympics in the Open Olympics. But there are amazing prosthetics out there. But this fellow had a prosthetic. And the one thing you cannot do is climb ladders and scaffolding. They don't have that one yet. They don't have that one yet that does this. They don't have it. So he was a person, when they interviewed him, they asked him all the right questions. He tried to inject that into the interview. Well, I have a prosthetic, but I, they said, no, can you perform the essential functions, right? He says, yes, we send him off doing the right thing. Send him off saying, listen, you provisionally have the job because he had all the qualifications in the world, but you have to be performing the essential function. He goes to the doctor with the job description. This is how you do it. Post offer pre-employment to the doctor. The doctor writes back and says, he cannot climb ladders of scaffolding. Because he's, he is, he lost one leg. It's called a, not a paraplegia, he's a amputee, single amputee. That's what I was looking for. I just couldn't get up. We had too many things. Amputee. So this person in West Virginia does not get the job. The doctor said he didn't get a job. And I said, listen, you did everything right. That did, that's textbook. That's how life is supposed to work. Well, he goes and files a claim with the West Virginia Human Rights Commission and in turn then the EEOC, which is West Virginia. And the West Virginia Human Rights Commission, before he gets to the EEOC, says, oh, no, he has a claim. There is no claim. That's why I said be careful of your jurisdictions. When you go to multi-states, know how crazy those other states are and make sure it's worth your being there. Okay? This person, unfortunately, and I'm telling you a true story, I got an email yesterday from the client, and I'm sitting here in Vancouver three hours behind, and the email tells me that this person, while he has a lawsuit pending, has now come back and reapplied for the same job. And I don't mind telling you, I'm sitting there, I'm at Road, which is right across the street, and I'm having a I'm having quinoa and kale. Now, let me tell you, that's a lot of problems for me getting quinoa and kale, but I did get fries too, and the fries were good. And I'm sitting there, and I see the email, and I'm crestfallen. I'm like, what the, excuse me, PG-13, what the hell are you supposed to do? That's why you can't screw up applications. You can't screw up any of these processes because they don't care where you screw up, okay? You can ask most questions unless they're illegal, right? You can ask most questions. Now, there are questions if the door is open. If it's something that's open and obvious, for example, Right, open and obvious. The ADA actually does allow, in that situation, for example, if they chose to have done it, they could have said, well, listen, the job requires climbing. You're sitting here with one leg and prosthetic. Let's take a break from the interview. Let's walk outside and show me how you climb a ladder. The ADA actually allows that. Most people don't do it, right? And I do not recommend it or recommend it, but that's an actual statement of fact. So the questions that you ask, they move. Everyone has to be trained. I like our process much better with that situation. Situation is, they made him an offer. Then they sent him right to the doctor. Doctor came back and said, no, you can't do the job. And this fool still sued. Right? And he has a lawyer. United States of West Virginia. Be careful. Okay? Local jurisdictions matter. Um, okay, I should do this one right now, too. Generally speaking, I know I was asked, I was do, we were doing a break before this started, it was like, you know, what questions are legal and what questions aren't legal? If you have any on your mind, I want you to ask me. 
What I will tell you again, though, is the universe of what you can ask is broad, as long as it's job-related, as long as it's job-related. I will tell you, though, a danger, a danger of interviewing or people who are not trained interviewing, right? In the scenario, which I told you about earlier, in the scenario, there is a maintenance position, a maintenance head. So maintenance, I don't, you know, I mean the person who fixes the equipment, HVAC, they're in charge of it, they have a team. This client of mine, this client of mine, and I'm embarrassed to say it's client of mine because they should have known better. They should have known better, but it happened. They had a 360 degree interview where they had two candidates. One was a male, one was a female. Both eminently qualified, right? They brought the staff in and said, interview them, ask them questions because they need to know how to work on a GE boiler from whatever. They need to know how to do X, whatever it is. Ask them questions. Great idea. Great idea. So the guy comes in first, they, the, the employees interview the guy, you know, tell us about how you manage. I mean, ask him really actually very good and insightful questions. You know, if I have a problem, how do I come to you? Is it okay if you, you know, if I come twice? You know, just things that, and that's, that's work related. Those are great questions. The woman comes in. They ask a couple of good questions. Then the hand shoots up. And she clearly was at least at an age where this person perceived her to be, you know, still within childbearing phrases. And he says, What's going to happen once you have a baby and you're out of work for six months? Did you hear his groan? Oh, my God, that was my groan. I mean, it was like, oh, no, really? Did that happen? You know, made me want to cover up myself because I felt like I was getting hit, right? And that's exactly what happened. So they call me and tell me this has happened in the interview, and I'm like, let's ponder this for a moment. That's not one of those things where you just go, oh, that's all right, because it's not all right. That sort of sucks, Right? So I said, you got to do this. This is what you got to do. Because sometimes you got to figure out how to interact. I love what I do for a living because it's just people law. It's HR law. That's what it is. I said, first and foremost, you got to call him back and make sure you sort of disavow. Listen, that question's inappropriate. I'm sorry he asked it, but you handled yourself very, very well. Hard part now, obviously, is we want to choose the guy, right, if we want to. And then you have to explain to her, look, this is how it happened, and you have to hope that your explanation is enough. There are no easy answers and that kind of stuff. There's no Disney on employment law. There is no, oh, this is, you know, mismanagement, and this is how you do it. Mismanagement tells you how to do etiquette things right and right down. We don't, I don't follow, but that's okay. So that's the kind of stuff that comes up in interviews that you're not prepared for. And what I will tell you about the types of questions is this. You can always expect the unexpected when people aren't trained. Okay? Now, in that person's mind, I don't mind telling you, that felt like a very job-related question. But that's when you have to say, listen, there are certain things when you are exposed and we're sending you to an applicant, you can ask a lot of things, but as long as you can link them to the job, right? And they should not be about a person's race, sex, gender, religion, right? If I come in and I'm wearing a hajib, you know, you should ask me, well, we have to work seven days a week. Can you work on, you know, X? You know, I know you're Jewish. Can you work on X? You, you can't, you know, that you, have, that's, that's, you just have to train that. You have to train that and you have to hope. And if it happens, you have to be able to deflect it as quickly as possible. What time are we supposed to stop? I don't know that. Soon? Soon? Oh, crap. It's so hard. It's so hard to get through so much fun stuff. And you guys didn't even have all the fun stuff. But I think that's a great place to be. When you are in your interview process, and I want to find something real quickly. When you are in your interview process, you want to always ask yourself, can we justify our decision? Can we justify our application, our questions, our our?" our mode of operation to a third party. Because ultimately, that's exactly what you have to do. Why did I grab my big phone, you ask? Okay? I'm not going to give Carl a lot of credit, but Carl was good. Carl was good. Carl was one, he was a HR consultant. And see, I'm different. You need to understand this about me. I, you know, my kids will tell you, Daddy fires people all the time. And I do. But I don't really fire them. I just talk to my clients about what it is you're trying to consider and how you get there. Right? People ask, I can tell you all the laws associated with how you conduct proper interviews or inappropriate interviews. I can tell you what's not appropriate. You can do it. Sometimes you're surprised, though, because you can never anticipate how much ignorance can come out of a person's mouth. Statement of fact. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes you're just surprised at how much ignorance can come out of somebody's mouth. And you can never be prepared for that. Imagine your kids conducting an interview. Right? They're going to ask all kinds of things. Do you like SpongeBob? How much do you watch Disney Channel? Right? Some of that stuff's not going to be a problem. This is only be a problem when they get to something that's illegal. All right. I got my phone. I got my phone. I know I have to stop momentarily. I can tell you all the illegal questions um, 
that are there, or, or I can tell you they're illegal once you hear them. Bearing in mind, you, all you're talking about is the fundamental law. You're talking about the law. And is this question designed to elicit an answer that may appear to be discriminatory? Remember, lowest level of conduct based on race, sex, religion, national origin, ADA, maybe even FMLA. We've had a lot of people take leave. And that's why you don't ask, for example, in your last job, you know, did you have a workers' comp injury? It's not really that you, you know, you want to know how much time they missed. But the person says, yeah, I had three discs taken on my back or, you know, I had two of them fused. You've now moved into an ADA conversation already, right? So you can't do it that way. Now, this is employment law 201 because we're coming to an end. 201, 201. I told you when people give you information you didn't ask for, I want you just to move beyond it. Doesn't mean you don't hear it. That's 201. But it means you then find a legitimate non-discriminatory reason to make the decision you want to make. Okay? More times than not, I've had clients call me and say, and this is a great example, Victor, that person worked for this company, they are unionized, and we, we cannot have him in here. He looks like a union red hot waiting to come in. It's illegal to, to not hire a person because of their association with the union. The National Labor Relations Board, the U.S. says that's absolutely illegal, and trust me, this board is very aggressive. So that would be an illegal reason. But what you're going to do then, is you're going to find that person who's either more qualified, that person who is more available, whatever it is. And sometimes you, hold your, you cross your fingers and hold your breath. Okay? A couple things. So I didn't spend any time, and this really, that would be less me than it would be someone like Carl, who was, who was more of a consultant. Carl asked a couple of questions, and they were questions, and I, and I, I submit these to you as part of your interview process. He, and you have to sit in the whole thing, I'm not going to recount what he said. But he asked a couple of questions that he found effective in weeding out certain types of people. And I thought they were really good. I mean, as I heard them in my ear, you know, and again, I'm 25 plus years of labor and employment experience. So when I hear something that makes me go, hmm, I think it's interesting. One of the things he said, uh, you know, he said to weed out low performance in interviews. Now, that's, a, that's golden. I mean, when somebody says that, you're sitting there going, this guy's about to drop manna from heaven. What the heck could it be? How in the world do I weed out low performance at an interview stage? Because what you need to know is at the interview, we all brush our teeth, wash our face, and comb our hair. We all polish our shoes at the interview. And the question he asked, and, and I won't give you the backdrop to it, but I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll, give, well, I'll give you 10 seconds worth, is at work, are you fortunate or are you lucky? It was a great question. Because, and, and, I, and, and I think it's a great question from an interview standpoint. It's one that I will, I will submit to my clients when I hear that. And real quickly, what he, what he was really getting to, you have a forklift operator, I use that example. And they seem to be, seems to be you got 20 of them, but one or two of them seem to always have the accidents, right? And, and, and he wanted to talk about how people who get anxious or nervous, where well, they sort of get drawn to accidents, right? I mean, they sort of, something happens. It's like when you're driving with somebody and you don't, you know, all these red lights or all these stop lights are coming right in front of you, all these, all these brake lights are coming, and you watch that person not do a thing. And you're like, dude, you see it, right? Right? That's what he was sort of referring to. And he said, you know, when you ask that question at work, are you fortunate? There's nothing illegal about that question. But it's a great question because, and what he said, what you're looking for is, you're looking for the person who says, yeah, I don't seem to have any problems at work. Matter of fact, I like work. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty lucky at work. Things go, out my, things go my way. And it was a really interesting, and he had more to it, but I'm just telling you, ponder it, and I, and I can give you detail. He talked about flexibility. Flexibility. And he talked about, he said, you ask a person the question, you know, tell me like what the funniest thing is or, 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 or the most unfortunate thing that ever happened to you at work, right? It's interesting, it's a great question. What's the funniest thing that happened to you at work? He said, if you get a person, and I'm quoting him here because I think these are good interview tips. That I, that I, you know, again, this is not my daily with that part. I don't have to do that. I'm a lawyer. That's what you got to do, right? But he said, if the person says, well, the funniest thing was, I saw this guy fall over a bucket and, you know, and he broke his back or whatever, but you should have seen the way he fell, or, or just you know, nothing. He dropped $10,000 worth of stuff, whatever it might be. If he sees a third party's event as funny, that's not the type of leadership and person you're looking for. He said, you're looking for self-deprecating humor. Well, the funniest thing that happened to me was I tripped over something, and I realized from now on i got to make sure I'm carrying with both handles or whatever the case may be. You're looking for a person who learns from a mistake. And it was, it was a great answer. Last one, and this follows that one right there. He said, give me an example of a mistake you made at work and what you learned from it. And, and was that. I think those were really, really good questions. So those are good questions. Again, nothing illegal about those. And you may. The person may say, well, I learned because of my back, I can't do X. And that's okay. If it comes, you know now how to deflect that and you move forward. But as a general matter, there is nothing illegal about those kind of questions. And frankly, I would commend them to you. Okay? On that note, look at my slide one more time. And this is what you want to be at. 
Once you have made the decision, ask yourself, every time you close the books and the hiring is in, can you justify how you got to that person through your application interview process? If the answer is yes, go for it. I was just going to ask you about that very thing. So do you have to define what qualified means? And do you have to keep information about the people you did not select for the position? All right, great questions both. Do you have to define what qualified means? Absolutely you do. How do you do that? The job description. Your good job description. I spoke to someone from some organization in our nation's capital about having good job descriptions. White collar organizations have to have good job descriptions too. And so the job description says the essential function of the job, the minimum qualifications. So yes, that's the first, uh, that's, that's level one. You can't get to level two without level one. Yes, you do. He asked the second question, how long do you keep these things? There are statutes associated with like all sorts of documentation that vary. There are federal statutes and I can tell you about those. What I will tell you is this, with regard to any particular employee, any particular employee, you want to have maintained, and I don't care whether it's a scanned electronic version or hard document, you want to have everything from their application through their retirement documents in their personnel file, and you want to keep them for about five years. About five years, okay? And that's a general matter. That's a general matter, okay? Go ahead. Um, I was also asking specifically about the competitors to the candidate you did hire. Do you have to keep any information about them? As a general matter, if you don't have affirmative action obligations, you don't have to keep those additional applications or anything else as a general matter. Um, I like applications, applications being retained for about a year just because you never know when that person's going to complain. So the person didn't get the job. But generally speaking, what you're talking about is a Title VII complaint of some sort. Okay? And so what you have to do is, I didn't hire Victor. I didn't hire Victor for a position on April 26th. Is that what the day is? No, not the 25th, right? Okay, I can see it now. Woohoo! April 25th of 2014, I didn't hire Victor. Well, Victor has about a year to raise a claim of race discrimination or age discrimination or disability, whatever it is I might be. So I will not take to destroy those applications immediately. I like you holding them. Then after that, you, you destroy them in the normal course of your business. But applications are live, real documents that have significant meaning. If you get hit, for example, with a class action lawsuit that you don't hire minorities, you don't have people, and if you destroyed all your applications like the week after, you have nothing, okay? I would talk to your counsel about it because that's a process but I'm a firm believer that you keep those applications for at least a year. When you say you have nothing, you mean you have nothing to support that you've done it? Nothing, don't, nothing to support that you've done it properly or, you know, and that you can then turn back and say, well, this is the application pool we had. These are the resources we used to get them. Don't forget the Employment Commission. I didn't mention it, but if, you know, if you're looking at places, and I'm not advocating anything in particular, but if you look at your workforce, your look, workforce doesn't look like you think it should look just based on demographics, go to local churches. If there's a Hispanic population and you look and it's like, you know, and by, by demographics at least you know, it's like 10 or 15% and you see you have none, I mean you have a whole lot more, find out where the church is and just go to the minister and say, listen, we got openings. Will you put it up on your, will you announce on your Sunday bulletin? Black churches, go to them. Jewish churches, go to them. That's free, smart stuff. Free, smart stuff. Do it. I said Jewish synagogues. I don't know what I said. It's all good. Well, I, I know it made you smile because I've been to say synagogues, but listen, when, when I've been talking for longer than I meant to, and it's sunny outside, I'm going to say bad things about people in this room right now. Listen, thank you guys for your time. On behalf of myself and Woods Rogers, thank you for letting me be here. I hope it was useful.